Hey. Hi, hey, hey. Hi, how are Hi. you? How are you? Good. Thank you so much for joining me. I'm really honored. It's my great pleasure. Um, I just wanted to start off with your little bio. So for anyone who doesn't know you, um, Sasha Stone was born in Rhodesia, Zimbabwe, and uh, you lived through a war. He's a former rock musician, artist. Sasha Stone is an outspoken advocate of human rights and natural justice. Over the past decades, he's dedicated his life to setting up various initiatives like the International Tribunal for Justice, Natural Justice, with ongoing investigations into human trafficking, the Lazarus Initiative, reintroducing suppressed cultural, te technological, and historical insights through monthly symposiums, and his latest wildly successful bi-weekly news broadcast, Arise Guerrilla Network News. Just recently, has he has broadcasted his widely shared first 5G apocalypse summit, focusing on 5G technology and the remedies to protect ourselves from harmful 5G radiation. He has instigated peace in initiatives and education programs, lobbied against human rights abuses around the globe, and prosecutes for the protection of vanguard innovators, scientists, and doctors. He is currently developing the New Earth Sanctuary alongside Lake Bacalar in Mexico, as well as working with high-ranking military people and inventors in Romania to push zero-point technology as a source code for the New Earth Blueprint. Welcome. I'm so grateful. Well, happy to see you, Carla. Thank you. Where are you? Where are you right now? Just arrived back in, in uh, Mexico about 48 hours ago. Okay. Okay. You are just amazing at how you can handle all that travel. <laughs> I don't know how you do it. Yeah, I'm, I'm, beginning to have some, I'm beginning to have some thoughts about slowing it down a bit. This last year was insane. I think I was in a new country every every 14 days. It's just crazy, crazy, crazy travel. How do you get over the jet lag? I don't get jet lag. Um, I think if you keep moving constantly, you, your body just goes into a weird stasis and it doesn't allow you to go into jet lag because if I did go into jet lag, I wouldn't be functioning at all. <laughs> <laughs> well, I just want to start off. Um, I saw you speaking at the Conscious Life Expo and every time I hear you speak, Sasha, I it's just you you speak so much truth and wisdom and I feel like finally I found someone where I fully understand your language and whatever you say really resonates with my soul. So that's why you're on here. And when you said something at the Conscious Life Expo, you said um, human fellowship, the fellowship of man is a new currency. That to me just really struck my heart. I mm -hmm. find that so beautifully said. So I wanted you to start off with that and kind of expand on that idea. Sure, sure. I mean, in, in the simplest terms, um, you just need to look at, uh, at history um, and the, the history of our species, or just look at the history of this civilization. Um, the genesis point is fellowship, uh, where we're, we're connected, and then some third party intervention comes along, um, the Catholic Church in this case, you know, the, the, the priesthood, kind of creeps in to the, to the view and then begins to <clears throat> tax and tithe and organize people, relationships, um, especially the relationship between people and the land, um, priesthoods, which is to say government, um, comes in as the third party intervention and dislocates that relationship. And then we go into kind of civilizational torpor, dystopia, and we start um, falling apart, divide and conquer, all of that stuff, war, disease, poverty, all that nonsense. And then um, at the end of a cycle, we kind of recognize that the one thing we have is that we're all humans, we're all in it together. And there's a kind of morphogenetic um, interconnectedness that happens. And that brings us back together again. And Fellowship of Man reconvenes and we throw the dragon off our back. And Governments move into dissolution and humanity reconvenes a kind of upgrade. And then that cyclically, that's how it's gone. And then we've gone back into third party intervention. And it seems to be cycles 
like that. Um, golden ages have come and gone. Uh, the, the big problem we've got, Carla, is that we're lied to about history. So uh, no one has any real context in the, in the normal suburban sense. Nobody has a real context on history because it's such a depraved lie, what we're taught in schools and universities. But the fact of the matter is that fellowship is the common currency. It was the common currency before we fell from grace, you know, not that there was a fall, but, you know, unity consciousness, unity consciousness describes the square root of fellowship. And that's what we keep coming back to, because that's written into the human um, angelic human code is the need to keep going back home and re-identifying with one another and through the laws of empathy and laws of attraction and empathy, we we come back together again, we absolve, we redeem, we forgive, we heal, um, and we re-engage that flame of fellowship. So I'm just, when I talk about fellowship being the currency, it is the only currency that unites everything, all ages, all times, all civilizations, all blood groups. So that that's the end of it. That's the most simple way I can put it. That's beautiful. Um, I think a lot of people understand that, but they are so disconnected right now and they're searching for that. They want that connection. But when you're talking about that third party intervention, for some reason, just everyone gets lost, even though they still are yearning for that. And it's such a bizarre paradigm. Well, you're talking now about the the other kind of intervention, which is our first party intervention, when we intervene with our own evolution, when we block ourselves, when our own shadow gets in the way of our emancipation and we trip ourselves up. So that's <laughs> that's a little more complex because that brings it closer to home and no one wants to Generally, it hurts like hell to have to address the fact that I am my own worst problem um, and that I am not a victim of anything ever, that the only thing that can stand between me and bliss or me and enlightenment uh, is myself and my absence of self-awareness or the, the, the degree to which I fail to step into the flame of pure truth, which is to say relationship with self because a, a, a true relationship with self in the actualized sense is a relationship with the divine. And um, that's the rub. But in order to convene that relationship with the divine spark, so to speak, within one's actualized self, one has to um, temper the steel in, in a sense. You have to burn uh, over a white flame. It hurts. Because to enter the flame of pure truth, which is the divine relationship within self, you have to purify, you have to self-purify in order to um, enter into that living principle and be blessed by it. And that's where most people fall or fail, because it hurts to face that flame and to move into that flame of pure truth, because you're faced with a mirror. <clears throat> Essentially, you're faced with a mirror which is the mirror pool of self awareness. And you have to move into that and go into phase conjugation, which is a perfect kind of marriage with self. Self in that sense is the true beloved, the one we're seeking. You know, we're, oh, the, the, the blessed human condition is kind of tricked into the dialectic uh, or the paradox or the conundrum of um, black and white, black and white, night and day, sun and moon, Shiva, Shakti, male, female, up, down, left, right. We are caught in this constant flux of moving between hemispheres uh, because everything in this binary universe, dualistic universe is broken up into opposites. That's the checkerboard of life, so to speak. And it's a trick. Uh, the, the, um, the point of life is not to identify with either this or that, but to enter the transcendental or transmutative principle, the indivisible line between the black and white squares on the checkerboard of life, so to speak. Uh, that, that's the challenge of life, and um, which is to identify with one's divine 
Atman, one's true nature, one's true self, which is beyond um, judgment. Um, and and that, that blessing that you get when you move into phase coherence or conjugation with yourself is the step the, the stepping stone toward um, ascension collectively but individually you can move into that state you can be in a state of absolute grace <clears throat> we all seek that we all seek that because that is the alpha omega point that is the point of bliss that is the point at which we are no longer carrying the weight the burden of karma and dharma that is the moment of true peace and so we all seek it but the obstacle to that is self or shadow the shadow self the ego uh, body and so on and so forth and we can get into all of the mechanics of the ego or the false light matrix which is the same thing but that's essentially the piece so the people you're describing um which probably is most of us um well, do have absolutely hard nice time. Time. yeah, yeah. We have a hard time reckoning with that shadow element of self and absolving that aspect before we move into that flame of pure truth. Well, that kind of um, goes into one of the questions that I, I have so many questions for you. I honestly don't even know where to start. But one thing I want to do is talk about that aspect of self where we play the victim role. And this ties into everything that's going on in the world because we seem to keep repeating the same patterns and doing the same things over, no matter, we can't seem to learn the lesson and people and myself included, I'm not saying I'm above anyone, but how do we prevent ourselves from playing a victim of the, the consequences that we in fact have created? So an example would be, we want to, instead of looking at ourselves, we want to blame everything on the external. But the key is really coming to terms with the Atman, the I am, which I don't think people truly understand what that is. I know you just explained it, but I think people well, really have a hard time. We can go further into that. I mean, it's a choice. Everything is a choice in that sense. I mean, we, we all understand foundationally that our lives are governed by free will, that that is the, the baseline is we do have free will. We are also living in a false light matrix, which is, in a sense, predetermined. So our fate, the fated line that we are born to, we incarnate into this world and we have a fated line. And that fated line will, will, will eventuate, it'll happen on cue, which is why um, witches and crystal gazers can see and scry into the future and see certain outcomes which are predetermined. In that sense, they're predestined. But we can always overwrite the destined program. That's where free will comes into it. You can never have a worse life or a worse incarnation than the one that you have already um, been born into. So the, if, if you have a really bad life, that was what was programmed. That was what actually you had coming in order to, to balance the books, so to speak, at the soul level. So the worst fate line you have is the one that's predetermined. But the good news, the amazing news, is that you can overwrite that program anytime you choose, including thwarting death, you know, and thwarting the, 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 the horsemen of the apocalypse. We have that power. The angelic human has um, superluminal capacity to overwrite any program in the temporal universe. So we're not victims in that sense. The truth is we are creators, all of us. But in order to become um, at one with that principle of creator and then to invoke and to embody and be able to enact and manifest the powers of the creator, we are required to move into phase coherence, absolute frequency alignment and phase coherence with the creator, which is the Atman. So the Atman in that sense is an old, <clears throat> it's an old um, Hindu uh, reference, the Atman, but um, it's well understood uh, amongst the, the Hindu, uh, the Hindu uh, uh, folk. But it just describes the, the eternal principle of the living God, so to speak. 
And I, I like to think in terms of God not as being um, some um, curiosity hovering about in one or the other of the spheres, but as a, a living principle, an all-pervading, um, limitlessly perfect and um, bountiful and affirmative and beautiful living principle. And that living principle is always available to us in any uh, corner of the omniverse, wherever we be, wherever we find ourselves, we can align with that living principle, the Atman, the Godhead. And as we move into phase coherence with it, we can transport and transmute and transform any condition, any status, any situation ever, in the, within the, especially within the thrall of the fiction of time. So you speak about um, how difficult it is to achieve that state. That is true on the one hand. On the other hand, it couldn't be simpler. So again, it's an alpha omega conundrum because it is this path of least resistance. So it is actually the simplest thing of all to relinquish false light adherence, to literally release one's um, indentureship to one's own egoic mind in that sense, which is the false light matrix, the false light um, cage of reality. We can relinquish it instantaneously. And people do all the time, especially when they are visited by grief, very profound grief or sorrow or a very harsh accident. Um, it could be a, a motor accident. It could be something like that, which is very physical and very um, deeply traumatic and impactful, but those kinds of event horizons in our life, I know your audience agree with me. Everyone listening knows what I'm talking about here. We've all had those moments of sheer grief when we've just learned that a beloved one has died or when we've been in an, in an accident, had a life-threatening <clears throat> event horizon. It, it zeroes out the white noise. Those events in our lives zero out the white noise and catalyze everything that is real into an instant moment of now where we are forced in that sense in order to survive the event we are forced to overcome ourselves we are forced to learn to overwrite the program and um and so in that sense we're given the tools and the navigation set to know how to navigate forward and to um, overwrite the destined uh, or fated line and transmute it into a higher outcome. Now, what's exciting about this time, this end of time, time that we are living through is that collectively we are now given the benediction of the grace of God, which is also the wave of photonic light that is sweeping through this quadrant of the of the universe right now as we've moved through the ecliptic plane of the galaxy 2012 2020 and now in 24 25 moving to 3032 and then to 46 we are swinging through um, this photon band of high density vibrational light or vibral light which is truly the benediction or the grace of god incarnate manifested in the physical realm and that those photons are in impacting us as we hurtle in the solar system embeds further into that um, motion of swinging through uh, the grand procession of the equinox we are being enlightened from the inside out literally at the photonic atomic molecular cellular level everything is actually being enlightened from within there is a, a god spark a, a, a particle a particulate of vibral light that is impacting every cell and so that's giving us the the grace of God, so to speak, at the material uh, level, to be able to re remember our divine immanent template or blueprint, the angelic template is being remembered to us because of that. So those of us who are meek enough of heart to be able to receive that benediction of grace as it's impacting us and relinquish and release our hold on the false light aspect or the egoic aspect of self, of life, of so-called reality. We are the ones who are inheriting the earth resultantly. It couldn't be more simple and more perfect, which is what I've been um, uh, not arguing, but I've been postulating for um, many years now. 
this simple equation of enacting pure truth and right action or standing in pure truth, enacting right action in life is all you need to do because pure truth and right action is the path of least resistance to the highest outcome always in all ways. That was how I reduced the whole dictum of philosophy and spirituality and alchemy into one sentence, which we can use that as the, the, the path of least resistance to the highest outcome. We don't need to get into psycho intellectual philosophizing and spiritualizing and studying runes and books and codes and symbols and, and steels and, you know, getting into all of this kind of um, very enigmatic um, stuff to try to self empower and self improve. All of that is also part of the false light matrix. It's the egoic mind seeking to psycho intellectually spiritualize. Well, you cannot spiritualize psycho intellectually. It can only lead you into a labyrinth. Similarly, you can't just use the heart and emotionally feel your way toward baby Jesus or toward Ganesha or whatever bullshit you are manifesting in your own realm of imagining. If you relinquish your own false light adulation or idolatry toward your idea of Jesus on a cross, because that is not Jesus, that is not the man from Nazareth, that is a dead man on a stick. And the idea that you peg your spiritual um, plasma and your life force toward that Catholic um, Saturnian icon that is dangerous, highly destructive. It's what's led us into endless cycles of war and disease and poverty and misery and servitude, enslavement, indentureship. Surely now we want to awaken from within that um, false light, idolatry, um, civilizational dystopia. It all comes back to the same language. Keep things very simple. Learn to disidentify from idolatry, which is exactly what the Master Jesus um, um, urged, urged uh, his followers and disciples to do. It's what all the great prophets and avatars uh, always urged their followers to do. They said, do not follow me. Do not worship me. Do not make that mistake. And yet that's all we seem to have done. But that's because this third party intervention of priests, which is to say governments, Government and the church are the same thing. This notion that the church and the state are separate has always been the biggest confidence trick in history. I've, it's so clear that the church and the state are completely conjoined at the hip. And it's all about midnight masons, Babylonian priesthoods, and these diabolical, invisible masters operating from the shadows, conducting and construing how humans are harvested into civilizational wheels or... Um, great yugas of the harvest of humanity, the sacrifice of innocence. It's now time to end that cycle, move into the benediction of the living God, the living principle, the living gospel, and we have the power and the means to do that. Do you feel that, because yes, I understand what you're saying. There's still a lot of people. I don't know if it's the majority or if it's a minority, I don't know the numbers, but I know that within my own social circle, there are people who have, I don't like to use the word awaken because it's kind of overused, but have awakened to being open at least to other ways of thinking and kind of um, understanding that what you're talking about truly exists. I still don't think people can really wrap their heads around that third party intervention that goes beyond the church and the state. That is the hardest thing for, I think, most people because they can't go to that next level of understanding how this truly is orchestrated, possibly in another dimension. I, that whole part of it, I don't understand because we worship false idols, but those idols, who are they worshiping? And I, I don't understand how the levels go. I, 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 I could break it to try and break it down uh, simply. In the first instance, you're not going to redeem the irredeemable. You can't retrieve the irretrievable. You're not going to save souls. You can't spark 
as somebody um, intellectually. They either resonate or they do not. And if they do not, they will um, ultimately move into space dust and reconfigure elsewhere in another time. And that's okay. A lot of people are leaving this earth plane right now. A lot of people took a left fork in the road. That's part of the end of a, a great cycle. It's a bifurcation. It's a, um, an al alchemical process that happens at the end of a civilization. And it's okay. There's many sub humans and uninsoled humans that are now departing this realm. They have been the proxy of the devil. They have been an unconscious, witless um, class of human being uh, for a very, very long time. And that is that we're coming to the end of that cycle right now. And by the grace of God, that's happening. Uh, I'm so sorry. I've been slightly thrown off my question. You're going to have to just remind me what that question was. I just like the different levels of the... Um like worshiping false idols, right? And sorry, uh, you, you got me back on track. Someone just walked okay. in the room. And, and no, 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 that's okay. okay. Uh, I, I've got that. So, in that sense, we have been paying um, allegiance to false gods in this in this arc of so-called civilization. So, if we go back to the bullshit Genesis point that we are falsely educated. To, which is that the Sumerian civilization is the oldest recorded uh, history or historical reference that we have, which is absolute nonsense, incidentally. But that's the common kind of academic notion that we go back, you know, three, four thousand years thereabouts and everything grinds to a halt, you know. And, and at that time, you know, the, the, the Egyptians, the Sumerians, we were living in a, in a different age where we had God kings presiding over this realm and and giants were living amongst us so in that sense the the gods the anunnaki you could refer to them as that the nephilim uh, the watchers this has been we've been through so many different cycles on this this plane of existence but at that time we definitely interfaced with the god kings the reason why so many buildings all around the world still have the remnants of this gigantic architecture where these doorways are you know um, 40 meters high insanely big uh, buildings all around the world um, massive steps massive infrastructures that are being revealed in the deserts around the world I, I was recently in the nubian desert in the sudan studying the pyramids uh, over 200 of them twice the size of the pyramids of egypt twice the age um, and, and the pyramids that are being revealed now all around the world, in Bosnia, in Indonesia, in China, in Russia, all around the world. Um, entire mountain ranges are now being geologically and archaeologically now um, revealed as being nothing to do with what we've been taught historically. They are um, the remnants of eras, ancient ages and eras, whereupon this world was governed by god kings and by giants. There are multiple military and intelligence references now and even um, uh, NASA related or secret space program related whistleblowers and references now to all sorts of giants sleeping in stasis chambers underground and in um, space arcs awaiting waiting activation. I happen to know that this is true, incidentally. So I'm at a point, a uh, delightful point in my life where I'm old, wise and ugly enough to know absolutely the extent and the degree to which we've been lied to by the status quo. I have less than zero respect for governments or the churches or all of the infrastructure of dominion and power. They're all fetid and rotten to the core. Babylon, in that sense, is crumbling. It's over. The Vatican is a pedophilic, satanic construct. Washington, D.C. is the same. Uh, the crowns of Europe are utterly uh, redundant now. Um, these last vestiges of power, the United Nations and the European Union and such are also uh, these multilateral institutions are also crumbling under the weight of their own satanic hubris. We have nothing to fear in that sense. Revelation is doing the work for us. Um, but we just need to shake out of this myopia the idea that what we learned in school books has any reference to reality. I would argue that less than 20% of what you read in a school book is real. And the rest of this Newtonian, Einsteinian, Cartesian um, nonsense is, is, is just that. It's a very limited and stupefied 
um, aspect of reality. We're moving now into the supernatural. In the next two years, three years, between now certainly and 2030, which is a five, five or six years, we're going to have a wake-up call that is going to compress 500 years of blood cult and of sleepwalking is about to be defibrillated into a hyper-dimensional reality framework. And we'd better be ready for it. For those who are not equal to it, they will perish because the conceptual framework breaks down and the body follows. If you can't conceive of something in the mind and yet you are forced to see it in the field of reality, if you still fail to cogitate and map those together using your consciousness, your body cannot sustain. That's just universal law. So that is why a lot of people rolled their stupid sleeves up and offered themselves up to Moloch uh, in the name of wanting to visit their grandchildren or whatever. And no disrespect to a lot of foolish people who did that. The ones who have recognized that it was a folly and that they made a terrible um, mistake and they actually moved against their own conscience, their God-given conscience, those people can, are redeemed and can redeem themselves. But anyone who still believes that that was a good move and that the government was trying to help you and that Anthony Fauci is a thoroughly decent man and that Bill Gates cares about you, anyone who believes that will perish. They cannot sustain because the conceptual framework of reality is emerging in such a way, in such a form, that it will not allow for that kind of traction at the soul level. So people are dying. The spiking of morbidities and fatalities is off the chart. Um, it is the gravest existential threat to this, this uh, um, species, without any question of doubt. The problem is we're still being, in that sense, uh, cult programmed by um, mainstream media and academia that are still propping up more or less in, in the mainframe and able to propagandize and lie. This week's classic example of Donald Trump in a rally with 75,000 people uh, and Joseph Biden in a room filled with 75 people giving his rally. Um, that was a classic example of the dystopia. Um, love or hate Donald Trump, love or hate Biden, that's the reality of where we're at. Um, the real pulse of humanity is big, bold, beautiful, vibrant, dynamic, demanding shift, demanding morphogenetic upshift. And the, the false light reality is this diminished little wizard um, uh, uh, rattled with, addled with dementia and the poisons of being a satanic and wicked soul and his clique of, of Washington crows and jackals. They are demonic, diabolical entities, which is why they cannot sustain form anymore. So the Nancy Pelosi's of this world and the Hillary Clinton's of this world and the Joseph Biden's of this world are moving into dislocation. They are um, doing unto themselves. So it's a satanic theater that's playing out. We can simply sit back and bear witness to it. We don't need to participate in the theater, but we do individually need to take the throne of witness and actually begin to see that which self exists, self reveals and self fulfills as opposed to what we're told we're seeing. There's a huge, huge gulf there. I mean, yes, I completely understand what you're saying. I think um, for me, you know, as you know, I, I was very traumatized at some certain events that have happened in the past. And I found myself really, you know, engaging and getting on that whole uh, roller coaster of emotion and uh, feeling very depressed and down and all of that. But there's so many blessings in my life right now. And in general, I see so many wonderful, amazing miracles that like, I mean, that is what you're talking about when the photonic light is, you know, coming inside all of us. And when we are actualized, we can see that. But someone who can't see that or feel that starts to engage in that whole matrix Why world. Why do you keep referencing those people who can't? I don't understand your own delightful um, <laughs> need to keep referencing stupid people. Why do you keep doing that? Because, because I'm surrounded by people that I care about. You're not going to still... save them. Carla, you're not going to save them. As I said earlier, and we're just going to circle jerk in the nicest possible way. <laughs> Um, you cannot redeem the irredeemable. You cannot retrieve the irretrievable. What you can do is self-enlighten 
and then by the laws of resonance, you will attract them to you or not. They will see the truth or not through their own capacity to resonate to the frequency that you are putting out. And so that becomes the only question. We are all of us in this liberal intellectual vein uh, trapped into this notion that we have to be the redeemer and the salvation principle for the ones we love. No, you need to become enlightened is what you need. We need to each of us self-realize, simply work on the alchemy of self in that sense and self-realize. That is the path of least resistance because that's what activates the empathic waveform out of your living heart. That is what then through the laws of linguistic wave genetics impacts the cells, the living cells of the people who love you. Literally, the waters in their cells are connected through phase coherence to the waters in your cells. The empathic waveform coming out of your awakened human heart is what transmits the power and the majesty to them of their own opportunity toward the light or their, uh, an, an invitation for them to step uh, into self awareness. So by being the change in that sense, that's what it's meant by be the change. Because trying to do the change is never going to work. It never works in the history of this world. So let's not circle jerk and waste time and psycho intellectually keep looking over our shoulder and then trying to work out an intellectual or philosophical rationale to redeem people, even the ones we love. We cannot do it beyond a certain point. I mean, yes, if a puppy's drowning in the pond, jump in the pond and pull the puppy out. Of course, we do that at the physical level. But we're talking about soul retrieval here. We're talking about something far more complex and enigmatic than diving in to retrieve a, a drowning puppy. This is, this is soul covenant stuff. And it all comes back to the degree to which you or I choose to self-activate, self-actualize in the now, become the living principle to those around us. I've learned this craft in my own life. It's hard because I also feel the need to retrieve people I love, you know, and, and we, we, we meet people, we fall in love with people and we lose people uh, because the, the attunement is not there. They think that they know where, all that judgment stuff comes in and, and relationships go all fuzzy and both parties think that they're right and it's a shit show, you know, and yet what really cuts through everything, including time, as you know, is pure truth. Like if somebody dies, how many times does this happen where somebody dies and we didn't reconcile with that individual before they died? And then we carry this terrible burden of guilt, terrible burden of guilt. Like, my God, if only I just put my arms around them, if only I just told them how much I loved them, if only. And so we suffer this awful guilt, which can last for three uh, weeks or can last for 30 years in some cases. And let me tell you, the only thing ultimately is once we've released our own false light cage, the, 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 the false light matrix within self, once we've released that, we come to peace because we then enter into the knowing that the soul of our beloved, the soul of the departed is living in that principle of forgiveness. They're not feeling the pain. They forgave you the moment they left body in this world. And they're in a state of grace and peace, wanting you to find that grace and that, that, that point of serendipity and peace. So it's we're doing it to ourselves. We're the ones punishing ourselves. We're the ones beating ourselves up. We're the ones guilt tripping ourselves because it is all connected to the language of entropy, the language of constriction, the language of the absence of self-awareness. And it all comes back to that. So I, I just urge... I urge anyone uh, and everyone to stop trying to um, retrieve people from themselves because you cannot do it, but you can broadcast to them the living principle of love, absolution, and, uh, and all the good stuff. Beautifully said, Sasha. Um, for somebody who, okay, I keep saying for somebody can you explain to me when you talk about the dialectic and the only reason why I want to bring this up is because I want to know why we got into this point in the first place and how we are programmed and how we can protect ourselves from that programming and how we can understand and witness the um, Hegelian dialect and know how to recognize it 
in in mainstream society because i think well, people the, don't really i think they get tricked the, the the dialectic i'm not concerned about them i'm not concerned about I them i have no concerns for them again i'm working on the alchemy of me and then people will resonate to that frequency and then we can all we can all elevate um, collectively out of this shit show. And that, that to me is where I'm at. I'm simply never, ever looking over my shoulder, gi giving a consideration to how do we retrieve others. Of course, I began that way. I'm foundationally a humanitarian. It's, my whole life has been that for the last 25 years. I've been in service in that sense. But it took me a long time to learn that I was wasting time on trying to retrieve and redeem in those ways. I now know that it's all about how I comport and conduct and carry, enact, embody and manifest in life. That's what has a palpable effect on others. And the rest is just contributing to white noise in, in a sense, which is a waste of life force. And that's a crime against self. But in, when we talk about the dialectic, I'm simply re referencing the checkerboard of life. Again, uh, for ill or for good, we all clearly chose to incarnate into this realm of duality. And here we find ourselves. And it is a checkerboard. It is the kingdom of the devil in that sense, the void, the abyss, which is also the cauldron of creation within wherein we find ourselves is a checkerboard. It's made up of these grand um, uh, polarized principles, elements, and notions. Again, black, white, night, day, sun, moon, um, you know, <laughs> all the way down to the way that a cell splits and the formation of the geometry of atoms. It's all connected to this splitting, this bifurcation, this, this trial of separation. So everything encoded in the, in the manifest universe is a living embodiment and of the principle uh, of the trial of separation. And, and, and pr that's perfect because it's precisely within that that cauldron of creation, which is the checkerboard of this, the kingdom of the devil in that sense, we are forced to remember the Christed aspect of self, the, the unified aspect, and re-engage re that living principle of the Atman, of the Godhead, of the beloved. And so we do, and that's the hero's journey, and that's what is proven out in every single um, human incarnation through the annals of history. It's all about the hero's journey. And the hero's journey is what? Is, a, is the search for the beloved. And the search for the beloved always leads one back to the mirror pool of one's relationship with self. Because it's in that conjugation of the diminished self into the, the superior self, the actualized self, that we reconvene with our divine uh, mantle, we re reconvene that that conduit to to source, and the Christed mantle lands upon us, and we then get off our knees, and we stand as we truly are, angelic humans with this limitless capacity to steer reality, to forge worlds, to to manifest any outcomes, limitlessly. That is the truth of who and what we are. And in the journey that we've taken into the abyss, into this cauldron of creation over millions of incarnations through the fiction of time, we now, as we reemerge from that fateful galactic sleep, moving back toward Atman, toward revelation, toward the ascension, toward a source, as we are reemerging from that galactic sleep, we are also remembering now the true majesty of all that we've been, all that we've lived through, all that we have um, navigated. And we, we see that we have carried in the Jacob's Ladder of our, let's say, the DNA of our soul. We have acted as the principle of absolution, redemption for limitless other forms of um, intelligence and life that we now bring with us towards that back on the journey home. So every human soul in that sense, angelic human soul has been the living Christ, has been the Messiah, the Mahdi, the Redeemer in ways that we can't possibly imagine. You see, it's written into the code of the, of the angelic human that we are the Mahdi, the Messiah, the Redeemer, and that our lives mattered 
and and our incarnations have mattered and we've been you know we've been all sorts of um different expressions we've been you know evil witches and warlocks we've been good noble kings and queens and we've been mundane peasants and serfs and we've been through all we've been through all the different elemental consciousness levels of uh, consciousness as well through the living in granite and diamond and copper and 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 cobalt and 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 insects and plant life and furry mammals and you know dinosaurs and anything you can possibly think of in, in 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 the realm of the manifest we have variously been we have slipstreamed into those different elements of consciousness one way or the other each of us have experienced what it is to be a a, a praying mantis or a hummingbird or a giraffe or a, a lump of molten lava because that is what happens at the meta level when we are moving towards this fulmination, alchemized fulmination of the human angelic soul, we have had to slipstream into the consciousness of all these elements in order to touch them, connect, have that resonance within us, and then ultimately we move into the human and the angelic human resurrects. But we've taken a deep dive to get back into that angelic template. And then the remembrance is visited upon us of the true majesty of how incredibly noble we were to have taken that backward flip from Alpha Point a long time ago to participate in the creation of the fabric of soul. Please don't uh, ask me what those balloons are. I have no idea. Something with my uh, computer. And um, every so often, these, this, I think I've been hacked. It is so funny, but I was doing a summit, a live summit with the Alliance of Indigenous nations last week with the hereditary you know important uh, people looking in from around the world and these balloons and thumbs so appearing on my screen but he's messing with you that's so funny yeah. oh my gosh oh you know what one thing i i don't think people really get is that you have a sense of humor you're really funny did you know that well i, I didn't you know trigger that. those balloons if that's what no, you're referring I know. to <laughs> no 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 but in general you're funny um can we quickly go back to the false light reality just for a second? And can you, in simple terms, explain what the holographic universe is and how we project based on that shadow self that you're talking about, how we project and form our reality? Uh, I'm not, I, I could, I could, um, offer up to you a great many far more brilliant, uh, minds that I'm blessed to work with. Um, who would be able to explain it far better than I. So when I make the effort to go into this subject, um, I do so um, with a sense of shame that I'm not able to do so nearly as effectively as many of my great colleagues and people I'm blessed to, to work with. Um, but I'll do my best. You know, it is a holographic um, field of reality. That's how I reference the, this wor world or this earth plane. I refer to it as a plane of existence, uh, not to a planet. I try to correct my syntax uh, as insofar as I'm able to, because I, I recognize that we have cast the spells by using the wrong language. And we are consistently casting spells and re-identifying and reconsolidating a false matrix, false light reality with the words that we use culturally, civilizationally, it's very, very dangerous stuff. And that's where alphabet and language uh, become such an extraordinary subject, etymology and how we get to the meaning of things. Um, but yes, it's a holographic field of reality in that sense. There's no question about that. Um, we know that it is collective will or collective intent that determines the outcome. That's obvious. If I dream of something and then I draw a plan and then I buy the bricks and mortar and then I build the thing and there it is. That's the drawing. That's the thing. And all that came from my mind's eye. So imagining template, build, manifest. That's kind of how we've been doing things. Um, but it's not how we did things in the ancient world. Uh, my three hour lecture that I'm doing at the moment this year, and I'm taking it around the world 
Um, I, I've d just been in the United States doing some uh, stuff. I touched on some of this at the expo event that I think that you saw. Um, and I'm speaking about the ancient world and how we built and manifested these extraordinary edifices and um, these ancient cityscapes, so to speak, uh, ancient civilizations. We were 3D printing or 5D printing. We were literally instantaneously manifesting. I demonstrate um, how you can laser print um, out of granite um, an entire city in a matter of minutes or uh, hours. It doesn't take time. You look at some of these ancient edifices in India and different parts of the world, and you, you say, well, it would have taken a thousand years to build that with 3,000 workers who were all highly advanced artisans who had some technological capabilities that we don't even have today to be able to so skillfully carve marble in those ways or granite. Well, no, that they didn't do it that way. So it's just a whole different mindset. When you understand that we're living in a holographic field of reality, that there are no limitations, no boundaries other than those we impose upon ourselves and the, in the realm of the imagining or the imagination. That's the only inhibition. When you step back from that linear, dualistic, idiot, luciferic, false light cage complex, and you step back, release yourself from that ego constriction, and you go, oh, sweet Jesus, the whole of this omniverse is utterly majestic and utterly ecstatic and utterly limitless in its capacity to affirm, create, and expand and bring joy and delight. And, and then it's a question of how do you choose to dream? Do you dream wisely? If you do, you'll manifest an incredible outcome. And if you dream badly, you'll, in, you'll also manifest that a, a diabolical outcome. Well, we've done that for the last 13,000 years, to be sure. The last 13,000 years, we've been in a galactic sleep cycle. It's a, it's a semi-arc of the grand procession of the equinox, and we kind of fucked up. You know, we fell asleep, and we failed in a galactic audit, and we moved into a 13,000-year underpass, and we're now just emerging through that into the galactic day. That's the photon cloud that I was talking about, the vibral light or the grace of God. And now we're moving into a ascension spiral and we're leaving the fiction of time altogether. We've left it. We're leaving the duality checkerboard as well, incidentally. So we're on the brink of something which has never happened before, even in all of those many uh, civilizational arcs or, uh, or cycles of the grand procession of the equinox. We're even departing all of that language because we have earned the right now to move into the so-called spiral of Alcyon or the Ascension Spiral. So holography simply describes where collective will or the collective plasma of the collective dreaming steers reality. And, and that's where we're at. At the, at the mundane level, um, you, you speak in term, to, if you want to break holography down, you have to understand to some extent the mechanics of fractality and of torsion and scalar mechanics. Well, we now know in advanced mathematics and advanced physics, we now absolutely categorically know about um, that where we place attention is where the manifest reality follows. Quantum mechanics has taught us that in the last century, essentially but certainly in the last 50 to 75 years, we, we know that where the scientist in the laboratory is placing his attention, that is actually where the particle will go, to the left or to the right. So we set the intention with the human mind, the plasma, the will, and then the world manifests around us, the reality, the universe. And as I've maintained for, for a number of years, in the simplest context, all we need to know about reality, when we stop trying to be too clever about it, is that, that it is a universal feedback technology. It's holographic, which means there's no boundaries. Everything is connected to everything else all at the same time, but it's actually beyond time. And that where we, where we imagine or dream an outcome, that will manifest. Um, and the degree to which we are in coherence with the Atman or with the divine living principle of the divine will accelerate, exacerbate, accelerate or augment our capacity to manifest 
um, in real time. So moving from the third density field of so-called reality into the so-called fifth dimension uh, reality, we're now talking about a, an upgrade whereupon we are able to think and manifest almost instantaneously. So we don't need to um, draw the blueprints and buy the bricks and mortar, somehow afford them, and then you know build them one brick on top of the other brick until we've built the thing. We can literally start to imagine and see that um, emergence take place in the field of, of so-called reality. That's how it's going to be moving. Now, conversely, you look back at this material realm and you can look at um, how the extraterrestrials and um, some of these very advanced, technologically advanced intelligences um, are building craft that are hundreds, if not thousands of kilometers in, 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 in span, entire micro civilizations living on these artificial planetoids and death stars and space arcs and whatever you want to call them. When you look at that as a reality, which is a reality, um, you, you think, my God, well, they must be so much more advanced than we are. Yes, technologically, but they have to build those kinds of artificial realms in order to thrive, in order to survive. The angelic human doesn't. As we resurrect into our immanent, uh, divine, uh, perfected state of the angelic, w the angelic human will be able to instantaneously manifest realms, worlds. Um, solar systems. So we, we have the capacity to bypass time and technology because we are the technology. I don't know if I can get ever any further into this without becoming even more confusing, but the point being that the human being is the progenitor of the ultimate holography. That's fascinating. I've seen it in my own life. Yeah. Random things that I've dreamt about or think about have just popped out of nowhere. So I yes. completely get it small things not like you know spaceships and stuff like that but um yeah I, I'm finding that to be just very um common now and I think that the higher you raise your consciousness I think that stuff will happen so yeah um that's yeah. thank you for sharing that um I want to talk about uh I don't know how much you t time you have but I want to go into how you're building um the kingdom of heaven in the new earth and I really want to dive deep into that because all of us have to do that now and not many of us can just run up and go to Mexico and you know change our entire life but how do we build the kingdom of God the kingdom of heaven here in a suburban area or in the middle of the city you know for you people can't. who can't leave. you can't so let's <laughs> let's just end that there um, okay. you, cannot, you cannot manifest the kingdom of heaven in Sodom and Gomorrah. And anyone who thinks they can are on a death wish. So I'm not going to fudge on the issue because I love life too much. I love truth too much. I love humanity too much. So I'm not going to fudge the issue or blur the lines here. You choose Sodom and Gomorrah or you choose to flee from Sodom and Gomorrah. Um, you choose the, the AI... Um, contaminated, um, weaponized biosphere of a false light cage reality matrix of the cityscape, which will soon become the smart cityscape from which you cannot escape because you've already signed the contract and you are indenturing yourself to it for life. Um, this is the mark of the beast. It's all in revelation. Um, so you either choose that or you choose the other. It's one or the other. It's not a question of I can keep one foot in both and both camps. You cannot. You will simply be split down the middle with Solomon's wisdom. The baby will be cut in half and the baby will be very dead. So I, I'm not going to uh, make pretty language here. A, a city grid, um, if you take Manhattan or you take Los Angeles or you take um, Chicago or you take Johannesburg or you take Moscow, you take Tel Aviv, you take Sydney, you take, you know, I could name a thousand cities all around the world. Essentially, cities are the preserve and the domain of the parent corporation. So uh, Satan, the Luciferic um, construct or complex, owns, owns the matrix. It created it. It owns it. It is the meek amongst us, the meek of heart, the true human who recognizes the, the utter desecration of 
nature and of God in a cityscape who chooses to physically remove themselves and their kin from that cage system and reconvene relationship with the living soil. I don't care where that soil is, anywhere outside the city limits. Get out of Sodom and Gomorrah. You cannot survive within it. The, the, the um, electromagnetic frequency intervention in the first instance is diabolical and is com compounded in such a way that you are literally installing cancer, diabetes, and every entropic disease into the cells. You're giving yourself and your, your family almost no chance of reconvening their angelic template. So that's just universal law. If you want to reconvene um, relationship with the divine and if you want to um, truly uh, engage the immanent, immortal paradigm, uh, it's a choice. Then you leave Sodom and Gomorrah as a, as a divine act of consciousness, consciousness in action, which does require a, a degree of sacrifice, and you move then into convention with the living soil and you establish the fellowship there. A fellowship of human beings who are not themselves all enslaved and indentured to the time and the motion of a satanic construct. When the shit goes down in Chicago and the, the grid is jammed and the bottom falls out of the economy and all the above, there will be little choice but to sign up with the mark of the beast. You will have to become, in the next year it's likely to happen, just so you know, between this summer and summer of next year, it is most likely going to happen, whether you like it or not, that we are going to be forced into some kind of um, indentureship to the digital <coughs> um, servitude or di digital citizenship. They, they are planning absolutely lockdowns, they are absolutely, the unresolved aspects of you and I that we grant into the field, are yeah. planning a uh, event horizon. 24 into 2025. No question about that. Whether it succeeds or fails will depend on the collective plasma and the degree to which we are dreaming wisely collectively. And I have a fair bit of faith in humanity at this time. But anyone choosing to remain in Sodom and Gomorrah is going to be sustaining some real um, collateral damage. Um, that's the same thing as keeping money in a bank account. It is a stupid thing to do. The money should be put into soil and held in soil for the time being, whilst we reassess the global economy. That is the only place it's safe. There is nowhere else it is safe. It will evaporate and it will be transferred into digitized currency, which will be controlled absolutely by the satanic status quo. And all um, uh, transactions will be subjected to their statutory laws and compliances. Even now it started. In the last year, the banks have started to be pulled. Some of the smaller banks, that's going to continue in a massive way as we move into summer this year. You're going to see that happening principally in North America, but certainly it's going to happen around the world. So, no, um, there is no building the kingdom of heaven uh, on earth in a high-rise building in Moscow, I'm afraid. It's not going to happen because that high-rise building in Moscow or that um, heavily indentured um, su suburb is going to fall. It's going to have to fall. The bottom will fall out. It has to. We, we have to reset the bone in that sense. And the only way we can do it is by reconvention with the telluric wisdom of the soil. This, this here is, is arguably the, the, the most beautiful thing that I have in my possession. And that was gifted to me by the Hopi elders um, just a couple of weeks ago. This is the blue corn. And that was, that was a proper ceremonial offering that was made to me and I was deeply, deeply touched by it. Um, but that's because this is connected to the Hopi prophecy. This is, this for me is, is, is a, a gift to me to help absolve the blood in my, in my, my veins, my white skin blood the Roman Catholic Imperial Crown of England, the Dutch East India Company, British East India Company, Anglo-American Corporation, IMF, BIS, UN, World Bank, all of the utter sacrilege and desecration that has happened against the black skin, brown skin, red skin, yellow skin people of the world under 
the purview and the aegis of the dominion of my forebears and my ancestors. And that blue corn was a benediction to me, which I see as an absolution of that blood song within me. And that to me becomes the most potent thing I own. And I own a lot of big, beautiful things in this world. But again, it is meekness of heart that offers us that route to so-called redemption and salvation. And I'm just sorry to say, I cannot see how the isotope frequencies of municipal concrete and steel and asphalt and the diabolical false light complex of idiot humans um, running around screwing each other senseless um, through bad transactions and through shadows and projections and ego. I don't see how hundreds of years of that buildup of that flux, that psycho-intellectual flux, psycho-spiritual flux um, can go unaddressed. It has to have a reset. Now, you walk into a forest and you walk on a deserted beach and you walk in some beautiful meadow, you walk on a mountain ridge, you walk in some beautiful valley, <laughs> you go anywhere anywhere into the embrace of nature and syntropy is restored into your mind, your body, and your soul. The elemental forces of the earth, which are very real, these are living entities. These are not imagined entities. They are living. These are elemental forces. They are immensely powerful. They have been the flame keepers of true, the true wisdom whilst we were playing with fire for millennia those elements are coming back the unicorn the pegasus um the griffin these so-called mythological creatures are returning as well dragons themselves are returning um the angelic human as as it resurrects into the imminent light uh, under the universal sky in this plane of existence brings with it the remembrance of all of the junk DNA in creation. And the junk DNA in creation is the mythological DNA. So as that resurrects now, uh, back into the so-called activation of so-called 12 strands, so-called DNA, and all of that's a bullshit language. But just to illustrate the point, as we move into that resurrection of the so-called DNA, mRNA, and activate the Jacob's Ladder, all of those mythological elements start to actually resurface into the realm of so-called the field of so-called reality so you bet we're going into an extraordinary time so yes lights in the sky we're seeing them now every day on TikTok. every day um, the pentagon the vatican they've all confessed now to the 7500 year sequestration of the real information of aliens and ufos and hyperdimensional subdimensional intelligences and beings that have been part of our genesis part of our dna story all of that is coming to roost and anyone who chooses still to disbelieve in super the supernatural aspect of reality again will not be able to sustain this world we're moving into that shift point and it's happening between summer of this year and summer of next year mm -hmm something to not look forward to or something to look no, forward to something to behold with utter joy in the heart utter joy there is nothing but joy benediction bliss euphoria ecstasy that is coming so it's all good but it, again it, it, it depends on the degree to which you and i are prepared to relinquish our hold on false light reality or not if we're prepared to relinquish our hold on false light reality we become the meek the meek that inherit the earth. It's all so incredibly simple. And to move into meekness, step away from time, money, and fear into this new revelation of the new earth that is self-revealing, self-manifesting, self-emerging, is a benediction. It's only good. It's only empowering. It's only beautiful. There's not even a shred of fear in me. None. Not a shred or a trace of it. There's no part of my repertoire that is fearful. I'm simply speaking to the truth of that which is manifesting, and we can actually see it. So I'm describing the theater of Joseph Sock Puppet Biden in Washington, D.C., of the satanic pedophilic cardinals and papacy in Rome. 
and all of these sat satanic, diabolical icons that are still looming onto the screen of life, the Madonnas of this world, the Taylor Swifts of this world, these utter, abject, false light merchants, love, love or hate them, that's what they are. They are the, the promulgators, the progenitors, and the utility of Saturnian, Luciferic, false light. They, they imbue utter false values. Um, the most mundane and the most um, salacious, mundane, and, 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 and desecrated morality is laid bare. This is Molochite worshipping, Babylonian Mysterium cult worshipping stuff in Technicolor, and it's imprinting in our nine-year-old daughter's um, mind's eye. It is embedding that bad dreaming into our children, and we find any part of it acceptable. We are in Sodom and Gomorrah, and we will perish to Sodom and Gomorrah. And liberal intellectuals will hate that language and despise me for the truth that I bring. But again, it's self-revealing, self-fulfilling, and self-manifesting, and there is yet time to escape Sodom and Gomorrah. But that's not to say people should um, flee and jump in their car right now and leave. But I was saying a year ago, two years ago, three years ago, now's the time, friends. Start making the move. Start looking at the soil. Start <clears throat> reconvening in whatever way you can a relationship with the living soil. Um, and, and that creating that bridge in a sense, you know, psychologically, emotionally, spiritually, start to identify again with trees and with leaves and with grass and with soil and with the nat natural elements, because that's where redemption comes. It's coming from the embrace as the eternal mother is resurrected, which is nature, which is this earth plane. So it's all good, Carl, as far as I'm concerned. It's just, for me, it's a very blunt equation of, of are we still choosing to live in fiction and pretend that it's okay having a tea party in a prison cell? I don't find having a tea party in a prison cell acceptable. I think it's a tragic comedy, but I don't find it acceptable. And I'm never going to find that a joyful experience. That's very powerful. I mean, I have a hard time, not I have a hard time, but like, I'm happy. You know, I'm happy where I'm at and in my life. And I like nice things and I like high heels and makeup, you know, so I have, a, I mean, that's just like a normal thing. But right? That's beautiful. I wouldn't change any of that. <laughs> I know, but it's like, you know, I've lived in Mexico. I lived there for two years at one point in my life. And I'm Mexican, part Mexican. So I love Mexico. It's all good. And I love all places. But I was really craving the creature comforts of America. And which also led me to really appreciate the country that I'm in and mm. all the creature comforts that we have access to. Um, so that part... I'm trying to like really figure out like what can I live without? Now, I'm I, know it. now I, okay. understand, I understand where this is going. So um, all I'm going to say right now is, is I'm not allowed to make any announcements right now. Um, I'm just not. But um, there is very, very good news coming for anyone, anyone in the United States of America who, um, who is pegged to the new earth ideal. That's all I'm saying. Um, I am not giving up on America. I'm not saying that America is Sodom and Gomorrah. Many people are. I'm not. I am saying the cityscape is Sodom and Gomorrah because it's a cage. It's contracted. It's owned by Lucifer. So the mark of the beast will be imposed and implemented through digitized citizenship and through microchipping and through metadata surveillance and through AI avatar digital twinning, all of that stuff is happening and it's happening in the cityscape and people will eventually, ultimately uh, be able to say, yes, I'm participating in this contract or no, I'm not. And that's what it's coming down to. It's literally coming down to that. So you would be able to choose uh, creature comforts in that kind of Saturnian environment where you are actually caged and not even allowed to leave the city because of your uh, carbon footprint or whatever uh, bad dreaming they dream up. 
bullshit exercise to create a lockdown where even your vehicle will be prevented from leaving the city limits because you've already had your five days out of the city uh, this, this, this season or whatever, whatever statutory nonsense they dream up. But the smart city is a reality. It's a quadrillion dollar exercise. They're not going to let up on it now. Trust me, it's keyed into the great reset. It's keyed into how they can continue to harvest the plasma, the life force of humanity in caged systems. But that becomes an AI um, zombie drone apocalypse existence. It might be a pretty existence where you're all strapped into, again, creature comforts and the illusion of safety, but it's the opposite. You are literally in a dragnet of Satan and you are in Sodom and Gomorrah. So that is where it appears things are moving toward that or stepping outside of the contract saying, no contract, I'm a living son of God, a living daughter of God, living men and women of the living soil, and we choose the other, whereupon you are absolutely allowed, nothing can prevent you. There's no force on earth that can stop you going back into convention with the, with the living soil. So the, the sanctuary prospect that I'm building as a template for humanity is, the, the, is it all about creature comforts. It's all about elevation of art, beauty, and consciousness. It's all about um, having a full repertoire of creativity and abundance and delight, and yet not being indentured into the dragnet of Lucifer in any way, shape, or form, mind, body, or soul. So there is no part of the, of the, 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 the prospect that we are building and developing out that offends the human soul or that inhibits comfort or security or joy, delight or expression. So, but it requires a, an element of input and obviously that we, we have to move from here to there. That's a, a bit of a process, obviously, and that we're in the process of doing that. And it's a delightful process. And, and that's where I'm at. I'm not stopping. I mean, we, we are, we're manifesting what uh, we've been imagining boldly. And um, we're doing it about to make announcements. I think in about five weeks, six weeks, I'm free to make announcement. But I'm not bailing on America. America is, is, is my people. You know, I've said this a long time. You know, that America's in, in, I don't want to get into it right now. But the pulse of middle America is, as I've said, the pulse of humanity. In the same way that the soul of middle Russia anchors to the soul of humanity. In the same way that the heart of the, um, uh, the, the pulse of the Irish um, people, the Celtic people of this world, um, are also deeply connected and anchored um, to the elemental pulse of this earth plane. There are many different, very, very special elements. I and mean, we could talk about what's going on in North Africa and South, in Sub-Saharan Africa and Central South America and Southeast Asia. Every different part of the world, the peoples, the culture is connected to a different organ, so to speak, a different uh, so-called chakra or so-called so energy uh, um, uh, center of the earth plane. But America for me is the critical one because it's the one that determines whether humanity gets back on its feet and the angelic resurrects fully because America has been the utility of the devil for hundreds of years. And, and America is the, is the cauldron of humanity, all um, cultures and faiths and genomic expression is distilled into middle America. And that's why I love that place. So I'm not bailing on America. I'm bailing on the cityscape in America. And I'm suggesting that there is time yet for people to take their assets away from that because it will be locked otherwise and it will be depreciated. Um, that's happening. And I think it's going to happen very, very soon, incidentally. Um, can we kind of end on the, um, what you're working on with a new earth pharmacy? Um, and I want to go into not as deep as we can regarding if there is truly, um, I know you don't like the word hope, but if there is an opportunity for people, my nose keeps running. I'm so sorry. An opportunity for people <laughs> to, um, heal their body. If maybe they, you know, they rolled up their sleeve and took something that yeah. they didn't want to. 
So yeah. I, I just want to put faith or just a good feeling. I want to end with a good feeling. Yeah, I'll try and keep it simple and within the constraints of the law because I'm not allowed to say. Um, I'll start by saying this. We've set up something called the New Earth Pharmacy. I am um, involved with um, very, very advanced microbiologists and science group in Eastern Europe operating out of Romania principally, um, who are protected by very powerful military intelligence factions. And in the last year, I have been working with that group and the lead microbiologist to rush to the market, so to speak, um, to um, microbiological formulas right now, which we've done, um, that address two phenomena. Um, one, the spike, so-called spike protein replication taking place inside uh, the human gut, and secondly, the weaponized E. coli. And it is the um, weaponized E. coli and the so-called spike replication phenomenon that appears to be creating this um, um, uh, complex in every human uh, whereupon it is scanning the immune system and looking for the weak link in the chain. The minute it finds the weak link, it moves in and takes down the, um, the, the immune system. So the, if, you want to, if you want to know why 16-year-old um, schoolboys are dropping on, on the football field from myocarditis, that th explains why. If you have a certain genetic predisposition to a, a, a condition and you are living in a particular location with a triangulation of EMFs and and the kind of terrain that you're living in, that's another um, uh, factor. And then your nutritional intake can also become a factor. So there are a number of factors that compound into an event happening where your immune system drops and you, you tank. The, 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 the scary fact of the matter is that we're now seeing turbo cancers happen on a scale that we've never seen before. We're seeing um, mutations in human blood happen in ways that we've never witnessed before under microscopy. I'm working with many microscopists. I've made many hours of broadcasting in the last few months of this with these microscopists. We've been showing what we're seeing in human blood across the board. So we know that there is a kind of transmogrification or a, a bizarre uh, intervention taking place biologically um, with the graphene oxides, hydrogels, and these other chemical toxins, um, particulates and things. And the vaccine program, so to speak, vaccine, which wasn't a vaccine program, um, was really about forcing that um, drive forward, whereupon 5.x billion humans, we're told, have been vaccinated. So the, the vaccination of those humans brought about a, an event, an exosomic release. Uh, when the body is being poisoned, it naturally packages up the poison in the cells and then excretes or expels as quickly as possible those poisons. That's called an exosomic release or response. So sniffing and coughing and all of that stuff is the exosomes coming out, the poisons coming out. So that is now causing, appears to be causing transfections. So whereas there is no such thing as a virus, historically, in truth, there has been something like a weaponized kind of virus that has been manufactured by this complex. So it's predictive programming, Babylonian helter-skelter language, where um, we were told there was a pandemic when there wasn't a pandemic, where we fell into the fear complex, offered ourselves up to Moloch. Moloch injects us with poisons, which brings about a pandemic, which is about to erupt. And that creates this exosomic release, which creates transfection. So the people who weren't vaccinated are also infected. So great. Nice. Nice. Thank you. That's how it rolls. That's more or less a breakdown of how it's happened. So getting to market um, something that addresses the so-called spike protein replication in the gut and the so-called weaponized E. coli, that is the critical thing as far as we're concerned. And that's what I was called in by military and scientific um, brass in Romania over a year ago to come in and meet with the team, see what they've got. Um, there are, I think, five patents pending that are controlling that particular unique protein extraction technology. But it's phenomenal because it means that we are able to grow the antigens to every so-called disease on Earth in 43 days. And the, the first two uh, formulas, microbiological formulas, uh, that the group have, um, uh, have now released are one, the one addressing the so-called spike protein replication and the one addressing the so-called weaponized E. coli. So those two are combined into something called uh, spike turbo, 
available through the New Earth Pharmacy that arrived literally two weeks ago. When I saw you in, in LA, that was when they just landed after eight or nine months of obstruction, obstruction like you would not believe to get this uh, onto U.S. soil. So I'm very excited about it. We're very excited about it. Um, but it's, it's the thing, again, uh, let me stop that conversation now, quickly move on. You are not by law allowed to say that something cures even if it cures, okay? Wink. So you have to now let people do the math for themselves because the satanic corporation has set the rules of the game in such a way that you can't cure anything at all. You can't cure, even if you can cure it, you're not allowed to say you can cure it, otherwise you go straight to prison. So we've been completely trapped, hogtied, um, into these satanic rules of engagement. Um, so we're not allowed to promote the, the good word. We're not allowed to get out there and proselytize. We have to use um, obscured language like this um, when we're trying to save our family, our friends, and humanity from existential you know, death uh, and disease. And that's where we're at. But thank you for raising the question. And if anyone is interested, uh, they can go to thenewearthpharmacy.com, pharmacy with an F uh, for pharmacy, thenewearthpharmacy.com. And um, they can get one of two um, formulas that are now ready in the U.S. and are being fulfilled already. Um, one is just Spike on its own, dealing with that. And the other one is the Spike and E. coli combo. This is, in my view, the greatest breakthrough in medical science history. And we will begin now, uh, later this year, um, addressing a microbiological formula that will um, address uh, Alzheimer's, uh, Epstein-Barr um, virus, um, multiple sclerosis, um, Crohn disease, Lyme disease. There are about 50 um, so-called diseases that we have identified that afflict the human, um, the human body. And it is the belief of the science team uh, that, who again, I regard as having already cracked the biggest breakthrough in medical science history. It is uh, their um, certainty, it's not even a belief, that um, we can bring to the market, I'm choosing every word very carefully, as you can see, um, we will be bringing to the market uh, biological formulas, uh, microbiological formulas in the shape of a pill, uh, a microbiological formula in a capsule, microcapsule, um, or foam, cream, ointment, or spray. Um, for the multiple uh, drug-resistant wound infections, for instance, um, of which we've identified um, a number, flesh-eating streptococcus and these different um, superbugs in hospitals that start eating, creating the infections. People die not from the surgery, but from the infections. That's happening all around the world. Millions and millions of people dying constantly because of the uh, fact that these superbugs are out of control. That's what modern medicine has gifted us. Um, they've sanitized everything. They've destroyed all the good bugs and bacteria by sterilizing and disinfecting everything. And that means we have no natural biome left to defend itself uh, against real threats. And so Modern medical science has manufactured the worst, most egregious pathogenic bacterial strains we could have imagined, and they're now killing us. So we, this, the science group in Romania, have already perfected um, some of those formulas dealing with the um, necrosis and flesh-eating superbugs. So those are in spray, foam, but we're not, those are not being pushed through the New Earth Pharmacy yet. That will follow later this year. But right now, um, we're working, we've worked with over, over four and a half thousand patients, approaching 5,000 patients with unbelievable success. And that's going to change the face of hospitals and clinics all around the world. So it's all good news. Again, it's all good news. But I'm relying on people to take care of themselves now and stop that factory in the gut. There are other things on the market now. People are talking about nicotine patches and natokinase and what have you. There's a huge difference. Uh, whereas nicotine patches and natokinase um, are ameliorating, kind of brushing off on a daily basis, the so-called spike protein. It's not killing the factory in the gut that's replicating the so-called spike proteins. So what we've got kills the factory in the gut. So once you've done your 90-day um, formula, one capsule a day, as a transfected individual, that should take care of the factory in the gut. You've taken down the arms uh, the arms and munition depot in the gut. 
And if you've been vaccinated, it would be 180 days. It would be a six-month protocol, one a day. And after that period of time, you should have killed, again, the factory in the gas. And then we recommend, uh, or Dr. Uh, Nikolescu, the, the lead uh, scientist, recommends once a year you do another, I think it's a two-week protocol, it's a top-up. But right now, we're just trying to get that out as widely as possible. And every day, we're uh, manufacturing more of the antigens, more of the formula, and it's exciting. And we are talking to uh, certain government and military factions, let's just leave it at that, about the fact that this might just be the thing that retrieves uh, humanity. So I'm very excited about it. But again, I've got to watch my language. I always uh, do the sign of the cross just because I was raised Catholic, you know, it's like I'm programmed. But anyway, um, I do feel the besides that, besides finding a solution like you're talking about, going back to connecting to the divine and coming becoming one with yourself is the first step to heal yourself from something like that. Because I think that, again, you know, people do these things and they want a pill, you know, to like make it go away. And I think all of us have to just say, you know what, I'm going to raise my consciousness higher than whatever is in my body and heal it that way first. Yeah. Right. Yes. Agreed. A hundred percent, a hundred percent. I mean, again, in, you know, to go back to what I said a moment ago in a holographic universe, there are no rules and there's no boundaries. Everything is possible. So um, even although, you know, this, this so-called mRNA, DNA interventionism with the so-called vaccine, um, even although that is clearly an attempt at the mark of the beast being fully installed into us psycho civilizationally, um, it doesn't mean that it's going to gain traction. What it means in my uh, philosophical handbook is that that has created a cloak of doom that acts as a compression point that forces the diamond in the coal. It forces our Christed resurrection, forces our supernature to actually emerge because there is an existential threat and we can sense it in the subtle body. And that's really what happened in the 1980s and early 90s with HIV AIDS being imported into Africa to try to devastate the black genome and take down and begin a harvest of our black brothers and sisters. That was categorically intended um, by the evil science coming out of the evil empire, which is the Anglo-American corporation. That was an attempt in the 80s and 90s to foist population reduction amongst the black uh, genome. Uh, it failed miserably. Why? Um, well, it, 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 it killed a lot of people for uh, over a decade. It was the biggest scare happening in the world. And it, it created a, a, a thrall of doom and, and fear all around the world. And it um, inhibited lovemaking. It inhibited all sorts of beautiful expression in this world, a diabolical cultural programming that was going on. But what it actually did at the um, biophysical level and at the electrochemical level, at the spiritual level, it created a catalyzing event um, in the instinctual nature of the human technology, where we recognized that there was an existential, artificial existential threat that was coming at us. And we worked the problem out subliminally and through linguistic wave genetics and morphogenetics, again, the morphogenesis of this, the collective unconscious was actually doing the work, the, the real dreaming. And we literally flamed that into existence, that resurrection, and it killed HIV AIDS. It, it stopped that from being what it was. We adapted the human genome uh, linguistic, through the linguistic wave genetics. We adapted our collective human genomic expression to throw the devil off our back. And we did that. And we've done that multiple times because we have that capacitance. Again, we've got the God code in the human being and it always emerges when there's a real existential threat. Yeah. That's the blessing in this situation. Indeed. That's Indeed. awesome. Sasha, thank you so much. I could go on and on, but I know you're a busy man and you, um, you're fascinating and I'm really grateful for this exchange. I can't thank you enough for being a light in the world. Thank you. And it's been lovely speaking yeah. to you. Great to look forward okay. to seeing you. All right. Again. Bye. <laughs>